Now, um, in other news, uh, we like to follow the LHC because it's a wonderful, wonderful machine. Um, and the Higgs boson, we do not say God particle, we think it's a terrible word for it. In fact, we shouldn't even say that we don't say it. You're right, we shouldn't. The, the, what don't we say? We, that we don't say nothing. <laughs> uh, the Higgs boson. <laughs> the first rule of the Higgs boson. <laughs> don't mention the other phrasing. The other phrasing. So the um, Higgs boson hasn't been found yet. No, uh, which has a lot of scientists very unhappy, um, although it's not necessarily surprising. I mean, Apparently, the, the number of places to look for it are steadily diminishing, which is freaking people out a bit. However, they have been looking for it in the less likely places first. Fair enough. Ah, I didn't know that. Um, um, apparently, the, the energy levels that they've got to look at, uh, re the remaining energy levels for next year are lower energy levels, therefore harder to detect. So right. they've been looking at the easy ones first. Ah, okay. Uh, but it's they reckon it's more likely that the detection range is, mm -hmm. is in the lower levels. Absolutely. So, so the news here is that um, the LHC has announced that they've wrapped up, for at least for this year, so a couple of months early, um, any of the experiments which might have shown any glimpses of the Higgs boson. Um, we won't get into, we're, we're assuming our listeners probably know something about the Higgs boson, so we're not going to get into trying to explain it yeah. very much. Uh, go and look it up, it's fascinating stuff. Um, it's one what, of the big what, mysteries at the moment. What is interesting now is, is you're going to get a, a possible coincidence of the, the uh, sensible scientific people at the LHC doing experiments to try and find the Higgs boson, really important thing. In the year 2012, where all the nutters are expecting something <laughs> nutty to happen. Oh, dear. Well, oh, oh, goodness. And they're going to be building lasers that rip apart the universe. So this is going to be good. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> but, but there's also, of course, it needs to be borne in mind that the LHC is producing truly gobsmacking amounts of data as well. So even if it's not running or not running certain experiments, it doesn't mean that, you know, there's nothing I think there. that there's a little bit of a misconception that the LHC simply exists to prove or disprove <laughs> yeah. um, about, one particular the theory yeah. about the Higgs boson. And it, it's there for research. It's there to find things out, not mm -hmm. to prove or disprove. It's there to do science. Yeah, and it's doing the most, yeah, it's just producing the most un astonishing amount of data. So there, there are, I'm sure, scads of PhDs being written and will be written just for years over analyzing everything that's being generated at the moment. Again, we'll, we'll be uh, keeping track of this one uh, and seeing what happens, but, but it doesn't look like we'll be hearing about any Higgs bosons for Christmas. Oh, there goes my Christmas present. There goes my Christmas present too. Oh, well. Um, Kelvin, do you want to lead us into... Into temptation, <laughs> yes. Uh, well, uh, lead us into the future, into immortality. Something like that. Let us all live forever. <laughs> Which I'm all for. Um, yeah, very much so. I, I don't have any real gripes with that. I think it's uh, a perfectly fine idea. And um, basically some scientists from the, the German can uh, Cancer Research Center have discovered an, a, an alternative mechanism for extending the telomerae sequence at the end of mm. DNA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which is basically an easy way of thinking of this is the burning fuse towards mm. cell senescence and death. Exactly. So at the ends of, of your, your DNA are these things called telomeres. And with each uh, round of replication, that those telomeres shorten. So yes. exactly like fuses. And when they get to a certain length, the cell offs itself because it's, it's old. Um, now, in some cancer cells, this, uh, this is one of the things that can get disrupted, which causes cells to go cancerous because they, they don't have any sort of break on them anymore, particularly if they're sick cells. So they just go, they, they go wild. Um, but there's, and, and so one of the ways to lengthen telomeres is with a, uh, an enzyme called telomerase, which is present, for example, in very young people, um, very young organisms, but generally get shut down into adulthood. Um, but so we should eat the young? Yeah, well, no. <laughs> I did not say yes. <laughs> like, to be clear. Um, and there has been work looking into, okay, what if we reacted telomerase, but there's, there's the sort of the scariness about it, well, making cancerous cells and things like yeah. that. This, this is very necessary that cells die. Oh, well, at least to some extent, before we've got a handle on it. Um, but there's another way that it happens that without telomerase. And basically, um, they've been looking at some tumor cells, and they've got, uh, I won't go into the details, but they've got little protein groups on the end of the telomeres, and it looks like 
they activate a cell um, repair, a DNA repair sequence. So um, the cell comes in and, and rebuilds the telomere as if it were damaged DNA, as opposed to a fuse. So they add to the add to it rather than take away? Something like that. Or, or certainly, I don't know if they, they add to it, but they certainly stop it degrading any further um, and stop the cells dying. So this is obviously of use for, um, of great interest for cancer research because yeah. the idea is if that can be disrupted, then the cells can die and the cancer can go away, which would be nice. So yet another possible line on cancer cures, mm -hmm. of which have been loads lately, and oh, yet yeah. another possible line on yeah. living longer, of which have been loads lately. Yeah. Although, um, let's face it, you know, most people reckon we're not going to live forever because Aubrey de Grey has a ridiculous beard. <laughs> it's true. Uh, <laughs> anybody who doesn't know who Aubrey de Grey is, he is uh, an English author and a theoretician in the field of gerontology, so that's the study of aging. Yes. And he is, he's one of the leading lights in this. He's a very, very clever guy. He also has a ridiculous, a ridiculous facial topiary. Yeah, it's it's a truly astonishing beard, but, but uh, Calvin and I were talking about it earlier, is, is these sort of uh, genius-like people who generally have a couple of, of eccentricities about them, whether it's personal beliefs on vitamin use or amazing facial topiary. That, that tends to get them discounted by a lot of people simply for one aspect of, of, of their personality, of, yeah. of their quirkiness. Mm -hmm. And yet yeah, people go on to, to discount their theories yeah. or their thoughts or their ideas. Mm -hmm. Because of that, it's a, a terrible ad hominem Absolutely. argument going on. And but, it seems uh, a bit strange that nobody realizes that, you know, really, really smart people are probably going to have a couple of quirks. Makes really? <laughs> I don't know. I'm no, just guessing. Yeah. They all seem so balanced to me. <laughs> so normal. <laughs> Yes, well. Um, so, yes, uh, so there's that. Hooray for potentially at some point living for longer. Um, we'll, we'll probably at some point devote an entire podcast episode to topics like this because they're quite fun to, to get into. But uh, moving along, this is quite cool. Um, hooray for the Australian scientists. In fact, scientists from uh, QUT, which is the Queensland University of Technology. They've developed a new material for cleaning up contaminated water from uh, radioactive leaks and medical processes. Uh, it's pretty cool, actually. So they've mixed titanate nanofiber and nanotubes into a powder. And apparently, if you put this powder into a ton of water, let's say a gram of it, into a ton of water... Literally a ton of water, not... No, not just euphemism yes, for a lot of water. <laughs> you are absolutely correct, because I do use a ton quite a lot, just to mean lots. <laughs> Literally a ton of water. Um, and you make sure it's properly distributed and things like that. Apparently it can de-radioactivize, that's me making up a new word, the water. That's a really cool word. I know, right? Um, the, the nanotubes are coated in, uh, they say, silver oxide nanocrystals, and apparently they hold and fix radioactive iodine ions. Now, iodine ions are, are some of the really scary ones um, with, with radioactive leaks or processes. So would this, the, would this become, keeping things obviously very sensible for cyborgs here, <laughs> would this become a, a generic kind of kryptonite for all superheroes who derive <laughs> their powers from a nuclear <laughs> source, like a radioactive spider bite? Oh could, you, could you strip Spider-Man of his powers with the Mixed stuff. titanate nanofibers. I mean, it's an interesting question to get into, but one would probably argue that, that he was radioactive only very briefly while it damaged his DNA, but thereafter he's no longer radioactive. radioactive. So there's not much to clean up. But I don't know, we have yet to get a blood sample from the man. Or radioactive man from The Simpsons. Well, true. <laughs> Certainly <laughs> something to bear in mind. Um, now, no, uh, on the serious side, something like this couldn't be used for uh, accidents such as uh, Fukushima. Oh, that's right, yeah. Unfortunately, but it does, it, it could be used in, in a number of other, um, yeah, processes and leaks and things, and, and Australia stands to be the, the leader. And this. also to, to help keep the, the coolant clean in uh, nuclear technology. Of course, yes, that's brilliant. And, and, you know, the more we're able to deal with radioactivity, perhaps the less people will be scared by nuclear power, which may not be a bad thing. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> Uh, right, um, our next one, we've got some more NASA goodness, because NASA's awesome. Uh, well, sometimes. We, we had <laughs> just been bashing NASA them. NASA can be awesome. They can be awesome. This one's about asteroids. Um, and 
and I'm going to ask if Kevin wants to start talking about it or whether I will. Uh, I think you should because oh, my article has disappeared from my screen. Fair enough. All right, but this is just a quick one. Um, there's an asteroid flyby on November 8th. What, what's its number? Oh, <laughs> you, why you five five? Why you five five? Why you no five five? <laughs> oh dear. I'm uh, sorry. <laughs> we've had too much sugar. We apologize profusely. Um, yeah, so there's the asteroid 2005 YU55. Now I can't stop giggling. Um, and it's going to be passing the Earth, but slightly closer than the moon. Yes. Um, on November 8th. It, it's still a fair... And it's quite big. It's, what, it's 400 meters? 400 meters, yeah. 1,300 foot yeah. wide. So I wouldn't like that to land on my little country. No. Well, it wouldn't be your country for very much longer. No. No. Um, but, but, but don't panic, anybody. Uh, nobody's expecting this to suddenly veer or course and crash into the Earth. It's no, the laws of physics are quite immutable on that they one. They really, really are. Um, the number here is it will be no closer than 324,600 kilometers. So... We've got some wiggle room there. Um, I would not be hitting the shelters quite yet. But but pretty cool. They're going to be aiming uh, all kinds of instrumentation at it, including some very interesting um, cameras. And they're hoping to get pictures or, or images with a resolution as fine um, as about 7 foot or 2 meters per pixel, which will give really That's nice detail of the surface. Quite quite awesome. I know, right? It's, it's complete asteroid porn. So, um... I, I imagine it would take a couple of days for the images to be released. I don't know if they've got to do... And then we'll have a really high, well, comparatively high resolution picture of a rock. I know. Very exciting, but it's Isn't a it? space rock. But it's, yeah. <laughs> and it's one that's been quite close. It's been um, at least 20 years since uh, an asteroid was that close to us last time. I think it was in the late 70s. Ah, 76. Um, but astronomers didn't know about it at the time. And the next known um, approach of an asteroid this big will be in 2028. So this is it for a while. So what did you say? It was two meter resolution. Uh, two f yeah, two meters per pixel. Yeah. And it's four hundred meters. Yeah. So that's not that many pixels actually. It's only going to be a web image. Mm, that's true. But 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 if if you look well, if we look at a lot of the images we get, they're not always so. Oh no, so they're, they're barely even that. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Because <laughs> this is a very small piece of space. Absolutely. Debris, yeah. 